Immanuel Kant. Uh, Immanuel Kant, the most influential philosopher of the 18th century, uh, even more so than David Hume. David Hume is very influential amongst English speakers. Immanuel Kant is influential you know, across all Eurocentric uh, philosophy discussions. Um, uh, Immanuel Kant uh, made his big splash and kind of came out of nowhere. He was a, a college professor um, at a very small um, college that you know is not known for high intellectual activities and research and things like that. Uh, Immanuel Kant was like a professor, like like I'm a professor, like at Cerritos College, you know, not at Oxford or or MIT or you know uh, some large prestigious uh, university. Uh, Immanuel Kant was just working as a, a low level professor and later in life just comes out of nowhere with this book called The Critique of Pure Reason. And it may, it's a sensation, uh, you know, as far as philosophy books can be sensation. But it really changed the whole conversation of philosophy uh, very quickly. And he became world famous uh, among, you know, intellectuals uh, within uh, months of the publication of this book. So the main the main problem that he the that he introduces is how synthetic a priori thoughts are po possible, and so um, I will try. I, I want to just read the introduction of of uh, the a section out of the introduction of the book to kind of give you an idea of what that means. Uh, what is a synthetic a priori thought? But this is this goes back to uh, John Locke and the distinction between simple and complex ideas. So in terms of John Locke, uh, a synthetic uh, thought is a complex thought. It's made up of two basic, two or more basic simple ideas. Uh, and what Kant shows and it is pretty convincing uh, so that most philosophers maybe don't entirely agree with Kant and there will be some philosophers who argue against his um, conclusion here um, but generally he's taken as having pretty much accomplished this um, to some degree, at least uh, enough so that you have to take it seriously, even if you do have problems with it, you have to take it seriously. Uh, what he purports to demonstrate and, and does a pretty good job at is showing that, um, is that synthetic a priori thoughts are essential to human thinking, even so much so that uh, mathematics, which claims to be purely a matter of simple ideas and deductive logic, uh, and simple ideas would be analytic ideas in, in Kant's lingo, um, mathematics sort of presents itself and people believe it to be purely analytic, that there's not, we're not really bringing together I, uh, distinct ideas. We're just sort of unfolding the, uh, the consequences of a simple idea of number, of an analytic idea of number. Uh, but and, and what he does in the section that I'm going to read is, is he argues that even a simple sum like five plus seven is, uh, is synthetic. That involves bringing, to bringing together diverse ideas into a, a synthetic complex idea. 
And, uh, and, and so let me, let me get to that first and then I'll tell you a little bit more uh, of the story. So this is just a few paragraphs here. I want to read through it and make some commentary. Uh, section five, in all theoretical sciences of reason, synthetic, synthetical judgments a priori are contained as principles or, or as axioms. Uh, like in the way that Isaac Newton uh, set forth the principles of motion, but what we call the laws of motion, um, and, and those are really assertions, assumptions that he makes, and then draws out the consequences of those. Um, Kant is going to argue here that um, synthetic judgments uh, a priori derived not from experience, uh, not from experimentation or experience with the world, but, but purely out of the mind as a concoction um, those are contained as, as principles in all theoretical sciences of reason, including mathematics. And so there's no way of escaping these kind of assumptions that are complex concoctions of the human mind. So one, uh, mathematical judgments are always synthetical. Hitherto this fact, though incontestable, true and very important in its consequences seem to have escaped the analyst of the human mind to be in complete opposition to all their conjectures. That mathematical conclusions all proceed according to the principle of contradiction, which the nature of every apodeptic certainty requires, this is deductive reasoning, people became persuaded that the fundamental principles of the science also were recognized and admitted in the same way that the or rules established at the beginning were also uh, simple and analytic. But the notion is fallacious, for although a synthetical proposition can certainly be discerned by means of the principle of contradiction, this is possible only when another synthetical proposition precedes, comes logically prior to it, from which the latter is deduced, but never of itself. Okay. Uh, and, and, this, and this issue goes back to Descartes as well. Remember that I said the way that he, he thinks of innate ideas and good ideas is that they're clear and distinct. And so their clarity and distinctness gives them a kind of simplicity. And, uh, and then in mathematics, Philosophers before Kant tended to think that mathematical ideas were something that were just intuitively perceived as like sort of ground level facts. And then just from the basic mathematical facts, we can deduce all of mathematics. And he's, he's going to try to show that that isn't the case. We might indeed at first suppose that the proposition seven plus five equals 12 is a merely analytical proposition following according to the principle of contradiction from the conception of a sum of seven and five. That if you know what seven is and you know what five is and you know what addition is, then you immediately can deduce that the sum, that addition, gives you 12. But if we regard it more narrowly, we find that our conception of the sum of seven and five contains nothing more than the uniting of both sums into one. And so he is willing to admit that we do get the notion of the sum of seven and five from the notion of seven, five, and addition, so we do find that our conception of the sum of seven and five contains nothing more than the uniting of both sums into one. 
whereby it cannot at all be cogitated what the single number is, which embraces both. So his issue here is that we still have the idea of 12, which is distinct from the idea of the sum of seven and five. Just because you have the idea that seven and five are combined into a sum, that doesn't give you the number 12. It just gives you the general idea of whatever number it is when we sum together seven and five. The concept of 12 is by no means obtained by merely cogitating the union of seven and five. And we may analyze our conception of such a possible sum as long as we will, still we shall never discover in it the notion of 12. We must go beyond these conceptions and have re recourse to an intuition which corresponds to one of the two, our five fingers or uh, for example, or like same arithmetic. And so by degrees, add the units contained in the five given in the intuition to the conception of seven. Four, I first take the number seven and for the conception of five, calling in the aid of the fingers of my hand as objects of conception of intuition, I add the units which I before took together to make up the number five. Gradually now by means of the material image in my, of my hand to the number seven. And by this process, I at length see the number 12 arise. So let's take like the number seven. Let's treat this as seven. Like I go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, so I'm saying this is seven and then I add one, two, three, four, five. And now, and I'm thinking of this as seven points or seven fingers. And then now with 12 fingers, maybe I have to use my toes or something, but I have before me an, an intuition, a perceptual intuition of the number that is their sum. And we can give it the name 12, or we could give it another name, right? But we need something, the name refers to a something and he's saying that something apart from the name isn't just contained within the idea of the sum. That seven should be added to five, I have certainly cogitated in my conception of a sum equals equal to seven plus five, but not that this sum is equal to 12. Arithmetical propositions are therefore always synthetical of which we may become more clearly convinced by trying large numbers. For it will thus become quite evident that turn and twist our conceptions as we may, it is impossible without, without having recourse to intuition to arrive at the sum total or product by means of the mere analysis of our con conceptions. Just as little is any principle of pure geometry analytical. A straight line between two points is the shortest is a synthetical proposition for my conception of straight contains no notion of quantity, but is merely qualitative. So a line, a straight, something being straight is a quality and a quality doesn't have quantity. So there's this quality versus quantity distinction, which again is, is uh, like, uh, very closely connected to um, Locke's distinction between primary and secondary qualities. And um, he says, for my conception of straight, a straight line contains no notion of quantity, but is merely qualitative. The conception of the shortest is therefore uh, wholly an addition an extra idea, the shortest, the straight being the shortest, straight and shortest are two different ideas. And we bring them together in the principle that a straight line is the shortest line between two points. Um, And it comes by no analysis that it can be uh, extracted from our conception of a straight line. 
Intuition must therefore here lend its aid by means of which and thus only our synthesis is possible. And of course here he's talking about actually constructing a straight line between two points versus some curvature and looking and seeing, oh yeah, the straight line is shorter. Um, <clears throat> And, and these are these are reflections that, of course, as most reflections in philosophy go all the way back to Plato, at least, uh, Plato says uh, some similar things in the Republic. Um, so this is something that philosophers are just struggling with over and over again, and Kant points this out, where especially this naive empiricism that was promoted by Locke um, you know, begins to fall apart. So if you don't really think it through, you may think that you're being doing hard science uh, and I don't need to worry about any of this metaphysical stuff, uh, but, but people tend to talk, you know, they, when people talk about hard science and all this stuff, they are doing metaphysics. They're just not admitting that they're doing that metaphysics. So again, Kant is pointing out similar things that uh, Locke and Hume pointed out. Um, but now Kant is on the side of rationalism. Um, and we'll see how that how that plays out. Uh, but we see that he's he's in he's engaging with Locke and he's engaging with Hume in particular. It's through Hume that he, he comes to, to think about these things. Uh, as I'll explain in a little bit. Okay, so some few principles uh, posited by geometricians are indeed re really analytically analytical and depend on the principle of contradiction. They serve, however, like identical propositions, what we call tautologies uh, today, um, as links in the chain of method, not as principles. For example, A equals A. Anything is equal to itself. Any number is equal to itself. The whole is equal to itself. Or A plus B uh, uh, is greater than or equal to A. You add to any two uh, positive or non-negative numbers. Um, you add any two non-negative quantities the sum is greater than or equal to the, the first uh, sum and. Okay, the whole is greater than its part. And yet even these principles themselves, though they derive their valid validity from uh, pure conceptions are only admitted in mathematics because they can be presented in intuition. Okay, so these basic principles and, and like, the whole is equal to itself and a whole is greater than its parts. These are actually things, uh, common notions that Euclid lays down at the beginning of his treatment of geometry. Um, they aren't axiomatic principles. He has five axiomatic principles, but there's a whole list of some 20, 23 common notions that um, are like this. These are just if you understand language, uh, you know, you understand the meaning of the terms, then you understand this common notion, which can be thought of as principles, uh, but, but they're not, uh, and they are analytical. They're just a matter of understanding the words and parsing the sentences. Uh, that's analytical. But the a straight line is the shortest line between two paths or the shortest, or the shortest path between two points. Uh, that according to Kant is synthetic. And that is borne out in the work of Euclid because he does put these things in different categories. Okay. Uh, and yet even these principles themselves, though they derive their validity from pure conceptions are only admitted in mathematics because they can be presented in intuition. Uh, so Kant believes that you really have to see it to believe it um, at the end of the day. What causes us here commonly to believe that the predicate of such apodictic judgments is already contained in our conception and that the judgment is therefore analytical is merely the equivocal nature of the expression. 
we must join in thought a certain predicate to a given conception and this necessity cleaves already to the conception. But the question is not what we must join in thought to be given conceptions, but what we really think there, though only obscurely, and then it becomes manifest that the predicate pertains to these conceptions necessarily indeed, yet not as thought in the conception itself, but by virtue of an intuition, a perception, which must be added to the conception. Okay. So, uh, and so he still wants to say even these common notions are even synthetic uh, to the extent that we need to see it to believe it. We need examples uh, to see that these things are really true. Two, the science of natural philosophy, physics, contains in itself synthetical judgments a priori as well uh, as principles. And this is the laws of motion of Newton, which are synthetic, just like the, the axioms or principles of Euclid are synthetic. I shall adduce two propositions. For instance, the proposition, in all changes of the material world, the quantity of matter remains unchanged, or that's the conservation of matter or that in all communication of motion, action and reaction must always be equal. Uh, for every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. Uh, in both of these, not only is the necessity and therefore their origin a priori clear, but also that they are synthetical propositions. For in the conception of matter, I do not cogitate its permanency, but merely its presence in space, which it fills. I therefore really go out and out of and beyond the conception of matter in order to think onto it something a priori which I did not think in it. Right? I mean, you uh, Newton has to say these things because it's not really just a, a matter of the concept of it isn't it isn't uh, already understood within the concept of matter that it is permanent. Uh, in this conservation of matter way. He has to say it. And the reason why he has to say it is because it's not obvious and it's not analytical within the statement itself. The proposition is therefore not analytical, but synthetical and nevertheless conceived a priori. Uh, Newton did not go out and discover the conservation of matter. He proposed it as an axiom and then derived physics, which does match up with intuition, with sense perception, uh, but the laws of motion were concocted by Newton. And this is true, I mean, this is true, uh, but many people don't believe that. Uh, they, they, they just, through their vague understanding, uh, think it works some other way. And so it is with regard to the other propositions of the pure part of natural philosophy, okay. And then three, as to metaphysics, even if we look upon it merely as an attempt to science, yet from the nature of human reason, an indispensable one, we find that it must contain synthetical propositions a priori. It is not merely the duty of metaphysics to dissect and therefore, and therefore analytically to illustrate the conceptions which we form a priori of things, but we seek to widen the range of our a priori knowledge for this purpose, we must avail ourselves of such principles as add something to the original conception, something not identical with nor contained in it, and by means of synthetical judgments a priori, leave far behind us the limits of experience. For example, in the proposition, the world must have a beginning, and such like. Thus, metaphysics, according to the proper aim of the sciences, consists merely of synthetical propositions a priori. Okay, so, um, so he shows that mathematics is not purely analytical. And, and then he shows, and what's I think more important for us to get a grasp of here is that physics, Newtonian physics is not, um, the, the laws of motion, Newton's laws of motion are not purely analytical just from concepts. And uh, he's also hinting at here and what he will drive home throughout the rest of the book is that they are also not derived uh, merely from experience, that they are derived a priori, that they're thought up in the head 
and then and then what physics does is test whether those principles actually match with what we experience but the a priori stuff done before we go out and experiment and experience the world that that happens in the mind um, and then he wants to compare mathematics and physics now which are obviously fundamental and give us good new knowledge right and now he wants to defend metaphysics on those same lines that metaphysics can give us new and good information about the world but that doesn't mean that it's merely analyzing concepts that metaphysics always adds in things concocted in the mind and then after you concoct these things in the mind you see through experience if it pans out so he's proposing a kind of hypothetical deductive um, testing strategy not only does that apply to mathematics and physics but also to metaphysics okay and there are of course clear differences between these three things but he wants to point to this common commonality among them and thus defend metaphysics uh, from this perspective. Okay, so um, okay, so uh, one thing that Kant uh, acknowledges in the critique of pure reason is that hume david hume awoke him from his dogmatic slumber and so uh what kant means by that is that uh, he was wrapped up in leibnizian type metaphysics and just assumed that leibniz's vision of reality that i went through earlier um was essentially correct you know there may be problems here and there but in in principle leibniz really kind of captured what was going on in reality and then the empiricists are saying well that leibniz stuff is just bs we have atoms and 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 that and um and so the rationalists, the Leibnizian rationalist and the Lockean empiricists just butted heads and they never could agree on anything. And, um, and so they're just constantly fighting and they're always just defending their side against the other side. And that's what Kant thought that metaphysics was all about, was just defending, uh, fending off the empiricists and you know going through the same old standard back and forth uh, sort of um, almost like a legal defense of Leibnizian metaphysics where you already assume up front that your that your client is innocent and you're just uh, giving the best argument to show that they're innocent um, but then he reads Hume and Hume wakes him from this dogmatic slumber of not really considering uh, the other side. Because Hume, as I discussed earlier, Hume, his arguments cut both ways. It cuts against the empiricist, it cuts against the rational. And he is not uh, in a kind of legal defense of either one of them. He's really just rethinking it, uh, but taking seriously both. Um, and so now Kant comes along and he's going to rethink it, taking both sides seriously, but being more inclined towards this Leibnizian uh, metaphysics and try and, and it and the way that I read the critique is that. Kant sets out saying, okay, I'm going to take Hume seriously, and I'm going to take his methodology seriously, but I'm going to show Hume, you know, not Hume in particular, but, but, but you know, like he's writing a response to Hume, and, and he's, you know, thinking of Hume as his audience, 
and he's going to show Hume that there's more specific things that we can say uh, about metaphysics. And I, and I think he does accomplish that. But even more, I see him as setting out in the beginning as like trying to prove the existence of the soul and the existence of God and everything like that. But the conclusion that he actually comes to. Uh, so I think he sets out to do a kind of new and improved version of Descartes uh, meditations and prove that God exists and that the world is rational in the way that Leibniz described and, uh, and that um, there are souls, that there are these souls, these entelechy um, operating within every uh, minute particle of, of matter of physical existence. Um, he sets out to try to prove that um, not in the book in its final form, but, but he, he hints at that he started off in that direction, but then ultimately he comes to the conclusion and then rewrites his whole presentation in light of this, that uh, the noumena, these are these spiritual things, including God, the real world, the ego, um, you know, the, the monads, right, in Leibniz's terms. So noumena would be the, nom the monads, that the noumena are not knowable, that it's impossible to know them. That, that's, the con that's the grand conclusion that he comes to. Um, in his initial, you know, like the initial framing of the problem for himself. But then he reframes everything in, uh, in terms of how synthetic a priori thoughts are possible. And so this is, so I think he originally started out to try to do a proof of the monads, okay. He discovered that that doesn't work out, but in the process of discovering it, uh, discovering how it fails, he discovered something new that, that is very unique. Um, and to the degree that we can agree with him, this is a, a discovery. Um, but you know there are problems with this. But but if we just go along with this story, you know he did, he is laying out something that is fairly comprehensible and and very unique. And so that's what Kant really changes the whole conversation. Um, what he discovers is is that the way that synthetic a priori thoughts are possible. The way that we're able to concoct axioms for our axiomatic systems is that there are principles of thought built into the human mind. And so this is a kind of Cartesian argument in that he's arguing for innate ideas, but what he's really arguing is that there are innate principles built into the human mind and these principles of the human mind, he calls them the categories of thought. Um, the, and, and I'm not putting this in his own language, but what would be like more neo-Kantian ways of, 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 of talking about it that come about in the late 19th century, what it, it, the way that Kant eventually become, it comes to be understood is that there's something about the psychology of the human mind that causes us to perceive the world as rational. And Kant would not entirely disagree with that characterization, although the notion of psychology as we know it today is, is, had not developed. But once that notion got off the ground, then there's a psychological interpretation of Kant, which helps to make sense of it is that there's something about the human psychology that makes us see the world in such a way that it is rational, that it follows Newton's mechanics and, um, and that uh, you know when you do add seven and five, when you collect together five objects with seven objects, you get 12 objects and, and that all works out. 
Uh, not because, and this is, and so this is the weird part about Kant's and what he's really getting at. The world is rational and like Newtonian physics works, not because the world is really that way, really. And whenever we use that word really, we're talking about metaphysics. Uh, he's saying, we don't know how the world really is, but our mind is structured in such a way that we see it in terms of Newtonian physics, for example, and that that's just part of human nature. Um, but just because we perceive the world in that way doesn't mean that it's really that way. And so Newtonian physics is a construct of the human mind. And the way that we experience the world is a construct of the human mind. But the world itself is something entirely different in reality. And if the mind, and we can go a little farther, we can say if the human mind were structured differently, then we would perceive reality quite differently. Okay, so we'll leave that at that, and I will see you in the next video.